Today's talk is part of our lecture series, Conversations in Forest History. Our guest today is Xing Yin Kor. Xing Yin is an acclaimed artist who works in several mediums, including graphic novels. Today's presentation draws, and pun intended, draws from Xing's <laughs> National Book Award finalist graphic novel, The Legend of Auntie Po. Xing Yin, please take it away. Awesome. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I'm going to talk about, you know, making graphic novels. I'm going to dive into some forest history. Um, I'm going to sort of do this as a little bit of a variety show. So um, it's going to be a little bit of rambling. But the thing is that making comics sort of feels like that. Uh, but yeah, thanks for coming. It's really good to see all of you. I see some familiar names in the attendees list, um, largely from my lumberjack enthusiast friends. And I am I am really, really happy that you're here. So I'm going to start off with a with a short reading. Um, and then I'm going to tell you a few things that I learned uh, while while working on this book um, and and you know and some secrets about the book. So let's just dive dive into the reading. Logging a forest is like a dance. The loggers slide past each other and sharp blades and soft humans and heavy logs jostle for space. Polly's a bore, but he's good at his job. Do you ever wish you could work out there with him? Hmm, it's very dangerous. Mm-hmm. B, are you listening to me? Mm, yeah. What are you even looking at? Oh, who? Who are you looking at? The new boy. He just came down from Wisconsin and he's from a logging family, just like me. Dad says that he's a natural leader. He's young, but the men trust him. Dad says he'll be a foreman in two or three years. If he doesn't die first, May, you said it's a dangerous job. What's gotten into you? I'm going for a walk. I need to get kindling for the stoves. I can go with you. No thanks. Why do I feel so bad? B is just confiding in me about normal girl things, and I should like that. I don't like it. Ugh. Ugh. Ah! Hi. I hear you've been telling stories about me. You are, but I made you up. You're just a story. Wait, I can make things real with my brain? Be careful, Ame. It will be difficult. Um, okay. You didn't answer my question. Wait, what do I need to be careful of? Wait, I have questions. Ugh, even the gods I invent aren't that useful. I, I wish B could see this. Um, so that, that is my, uh, that's a short reading from my book in case, you know, you were not already familiar with it. Um, I did promise one of my friends, uh, Brant Macduff, if, he showed up that I would point out that the uh, the young lumberjack in in that sequence is absolutely based on him. So for for further information, that that young cute lumberjack is based on my friend Brant, who is also a lumberjack um, and a hunter, and has a book coming out soon. So this is most of the research pile of books that I read to write on Poe, even if not all of it made into the story. And the process of making this book was basically just me. Um, wanting to know as much as I could about logging history. And for me, it wasn't even research. I was just really interested in logging camps and in the Paul Bunyan mythos. And when the story for Auntie Poe entered my head, it actually was mostly formed because I did already have all of this background and knowledge. Uh, most of these books are in the Forest Histories uh, collection as well. And many of them are picture books, of course. So there are some research perks of writing a book like this. Um, I'm also a carpenter. But even in that line of work, there is actually no reason uh, in contemporary life to own a five foot long rusty crosscut saw. I don't actually need to own a five foot rusty crosscut saw to draw them in my book, but uh, I really wanted one. So I let myself get one as a reward for working on this. I do also really like nerding out about tools. So I took the opportunity to do so with all the chapter headers in my book. So this here is just a screenshot of a video where I'm explaining that a reason cutting teeth on a saw have alternating edges is because the saw needs to go back and forth. And if it doesn't, it would constantly get stuck. And the part of the saw blade that looks like a little fish tail is called raking teeth. And on large cuts, like on logs, for instance, they clean out the sawdust so the saw doesn't get stuck. 
So a lot of tool design is just making sure it doesn't get stuck. And one of the wonderful things about getting so indulgent um, with my research into tools and forest history is that I was able to include all these things in my book. So here are some early exploratory sketches before The Legend of Auntie Poe was the book it is now. Initially, I'd wanted to write a nonfiction book about the Paul Bunyan mythos and logging camps, uh, but I hadn't quite worked out how to make that book in my head. So I painted, a, I spent a lot of time just kind of painting and exploring uh, and, you know, just kind of learning more about logging camps. So this is, you know, a summary to anyone already familiar with logging camps, the tools that are used. Um, the PV, the pipe pole, the cant hook, these are all very common tools. Uh, this is a little bit more. It's about lumbering. It's a difficult job. The Pyramid 40, which comes up a little bit in my book. And uh, here are some of the chapter headers where I included all of these pieces of information. Uh, this chapter three with a crosscut saw. This chapter four with the jam pipe, cant hook, and PV. Uh, one of the really, one, I was a little bit sad that I wasn't able to include a particular very dad joke in my book, uh, which is, you know, the can't hook does so much, they really should call it the can hook. Um, I, I, yeah, it, it's really hard doing these, these presentations without feedback. I assure you it's a terrible joke. Um, but these research sketches actually became very useful later on, and I actually referenced them directly when drawing The Legend of Auntie Poe. So on the left, you can see one of my research sketches here and an actual book page. Um, and there's, you know, basically about three years between these, these drawings, but the, the actual book, book page draws very heavily from the early sketches that I did. Uh, these are some kind of somewhat goofier uh, exploratory sketches. Um, I really got into Paul Bunyan muffler men, and here's just a little bit more information about them. Uh, I'm happy to talk about them more later, actually. I just figure uh, we won't dwell too much on that. Um, so these are some drawings that I found in the Forest History, Forest History's archives. Uh, my initial visit uh, to the Forest History Society was planned for January 2020, which was going to be, which was when I was still uh, finalizing a lot of the drawings in my book. And I knew they had uh, W.B. Lawhead's papers, who I will talk about a little bit more later. Um, but obviously, we all know what happened in January and February 2020. I ended up canceling my trip. Um, and I ended up making my entire book without, without uh, the visit. Um, I actually ended up being able to visit again uh, in July 2021, which was the month after my book was published. Uh, and I found all these incredible drawings that would have been so useful to me um, had I found them uh, 18 months earlier. So these are some of W.B. B. Lawhead's uh, drawings for the Timberman. Um, he did a series called Old Timers Will Remember that was basically uh, really beautiful, detailed drawings about life in logging camps um, and specific details about uh, you know, what these things look like, which are actually really difficult to find in logging cam pictures because they are not drawn with this level of specificity. I was really, um, the word's not quite charmed, but I was really surprised actually to find these drawings that referenced things about logging camps that I also felt um, very compelled to reference in my book. Like I, I knew that in a very early spread in my book, I wanted to draw a camp, a, a map of the logging camp. Um, and it took me such a long time to find logging camp layouts to, you know, to figure out what this would even look like. So going to the Forest History Society um, a month after my book came out and finding this logging camp map by Lawhead was, was incredible. And again, I wish I saw it 18 months earlier. Uh, here's another comparison of uh, the, the, wag the food wagon carts. So in, in logging camps in sort of the uh, late 18, mid to late 1800s, um, lunch would be brought out to the loggers. And, you know, they would also gather for meals and gather together around, around campfires or just, you know, by the rivers or wherever they were cutting down trees. So that, that was something that uh, I drew in my book. Um, 
And it was also something that was drawn in 1946 by W.B. Lawhead, right down to, you know, the character carrying uh, the large stock pot of stew, which was a common, uh, a common lunchtime meal at the time. So it was really lovely to, to see all these things when I, when I was there. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I am going to give you a very quick summary of who Paul Bunyan is. If you're a person that knows me, I feel like you really should know who Paul Bunyan is by now because I talk about him all the time. But quick summary, Paul Bunyan is a giant lumberjack. He is a subject of tall tales stemming from the oral tradition, a homegrown American folktale, and one of few American mythological figures, keeping company with John Henry, Casey Jones, Johnny Appleseed, although the latter two are actually real people and John Henry does have a few disputed origins in real people. So what is the origin of the Paul Bunyan story? Like I said, they initially come from the oral tradition, which means that the stories were passed down verbally before they were even written down. This happens with a lot of folk tales, which take on a lot of forms before anyone ever writes them down. This oral tradition in particular comes out of logging camps in the 1800s, so that's over 100 years ago. Um, first, it starts in the Northwoods, which were full of European immigrants, but also had Black and Indigenous workers. And then as the story spread to the West, they ended up in logging camps um, that many Chinese and Japanese workers also worked at. Logging camps were much less white than many of the current written Paul Bunyan stories we have tend to portray. And in the early stories, even if the portrayals were racist, um, those stories do acknowledge the diversity of logging camps. On the left here is an image of Venture Smith. He was a formerly enslaved man who was very large, he was said to wield a large axe, and even in, in his day, was known as the Black Paul Bunyan. But the people who collected Paul Bunyan stories, who popularized them and who brought them to print, were generally white middle-class writers. And in the same way, these stories likely became a lot less crude. For instance, K. Bernice Stewart wrote the first published academic paper as a recent college student. I think she was about 22 at the time. And she acknowledges in her paper that a young woman going into logging camps to collect stories would only be getting the, cl the clean version of these stories. And W.B. Law had popularized the Paul Bunyan mythos. He names Babe and some of the other characters. Um, he was a marketing guy. If you're familiar with Trader Joe's, he essentially did the equivalent of putting out um, their frequent, frequent flyers, but with Paul Bunyan stories in them for the Red River Lumber Company. And that's how those stories spread across the United States and lumber mill catalogs. Um, Lawhead and um, James Stevens are our exceptions to, to sort of the very white middle class academic group um, that recorded Paul Bunyan stories because both um, Lawhead and James Stevens did work in logging camps. Um, Although generally in their youth, and you know, they were largely working class, blue collar people by the time they were recording these stories. Uh, but Esther Shepard um, was, you know, was a, was an academic and a woman. Uh, largely, you know, we got we got all white middle class writers um, recording these stories, and so I think a lot about you know what we lost because it wasn't recorded. A uh, slight digression um, again into Lawhead. Uh, if you have a chance to visit the Paul, the, the Forest History Society, I know some of you are from, I, I saw, said that you were in the North Carolina region. If any of you are near Durham, uh, they have an exhibit uh, on Paul Bunyan right now um, that Jamie put together. It's lovely. Uh, and there are actually five paintings there uh, that at six, I, I'm sorry, there are six. Uh, by W.B. Lawhead. He be, did oil paintings later in his life that very much based on forest life. Um, and I got to see some of them. It was incredible. I actually uh, didn't know he did oil paintings. So it, it was a very ridiculous situation where I was going through his papers, um, looking at all of these uh, preliminary sketches that he did, uh, reading his letters where he's referencing these oil paintings. And I think I'm actually like, I was about to like walk into Eben's office to ask him if uh, if they had any record of these oil paintings. And I just kind of like look past the office, like past the glass window into the hallway. And I see these six paintings that are already on the wall. And I'm like, wait, wait, oh, never mind. <laughs> um, these paintings that I just like walked past early in the day were actually by Lawhead. And and it was just really wonderful to see them. They were only donated to the Forest History Society in like 2019. So 
yeah, it's really lovely. They've, they've never really been seen before or exhibited before, as far as I know, in, in this in this way. So a couple other uh, exploratory drawings. Um, the letter on the right here uh, by, by Lawhead is, is something that really, really struck me. Um, sorry, you're getting a lot of digressions here, but I really love talking about this stuff. So here he's talking about how his painting, how he's not, he doesn't really think of himself as a painter. He thinks of himself as an illustrator. And part of what he's doing is trying to record logging life with as much fidelity as possible. Uh, but there's also a sense of, uh, he, at this point, you know, I don't think he knows, like, what his con con contribution um, to forest history is. I, I'm not sure he really knows the importance of this myth. Um, and, and it makes me sad to read some of these letters where he's just kind of making excuses for his own work. Um, but but as, as an illustrator, as a cartoonist, a lot of it really, really resonated with me. So back to Paul Bunyan. The Paul Bunyan myth starts in the oral tradition, and it's rooted in the working class and before making it into publication. During the World Wars, Paul Bunyan is used as a more patriotic figure, and this begins his transformation into a more stereotypical picture of masculinity. Afterwards, he becomes more common in children's literature and becomes more detached from the story's roots to the labor class as well as the history of logging camps. But what happens when other people tell the Paul Bunyan story? So an Ojibwe story goes as such. Uh, Nana Buzu, a trickster god, confronts Paul Bunyan, who had already logged out most of the northeastern states before getting to Minnesota. Nana Buzu tells Paul to leave, not to log any more timber, and a fight ensues. And after 40 days and nights, Nana Buzu swings a red lake walleye at Paul, knocking him off his feet. So sometimes Paul Bunyan dies, depending on the story, sometimes he just leaves. But either way, Paul Bunyan gets pummeled by a fish. So my book, The Legend of Auntie Poe, is about who gets to tell a myth. And it's because I'm absolutely a fan of the Paul Bunyan mythos, and I've been researching both this myth and the very diverse history of lumber camps for years, that when this question came up in my mind, the immediate thought was me. <laughs> I get to tell this myth. Um, and as a result, the story in this book is very much about how stories and myths reflect the people who tell them, that they're mutable and changeable, and that's an intrinsic quality of a myth that's told and retold. And that's wonder what's wonderful about them. Here's an example of how I interpreted a classic Bunyan myth. This is a fairly straightforward adaptation of a classic Paul Bunyan story in my book, um, The Story of the Giant Mosquitoes. On the left is W.B. Lawhead's illustration from The Story of the Giant Mosquitoes. My mosquitoes are smaller, they're only moving chickens. The summary of the story is there are giant mosquitoes that plague everyone at camp. In this pair of illustrations, uh, Paul Bunyan sends his loyal cook, Sourdough Sam, to go fetch the giant bumblebees from the Midwest that he had encountered before, hoping that the giant bumblebees would chase the mosquitoes away. In the book, my book, the same story is told, but Paul Bunyan is recast as Auntie Poe. Sadly, that does not work out. Mosquitoes and bumblebees like each other so much, they mate and produce a terrifying hybrid that have stingers on both ends. So they have mouth stingers and butt stingers, and this does not work out well for anyone. Here are some things I learned while working on The Legend of Auntie Poe. Logging was extremely hard work, so camps had to feed their workers well. Loggers would go on strike if the food wasn't good, and the camps with the best kitchens could attract the best workers. And often those kitchens were run by and staffed by Chinese men, who were known as fantastic cooks. I shaped a lot of my book around a fact I read in uh, Su Fan Chung's Chinese in the Woods, which is that Chinese cooks were actually not infrequently paid um, paid more than white cooks, and were sometimes retained by their employers for a very long time. Researching the late 1800s, around the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act, is a time where you're encountering so much violence and trauma being enacted on marginalized people. So finding this bit of information where Chinese cooks were valued, and that value was backed up by actual money, it was a true spark of joy in an otherwise depressing research process, and ultimately something I wanted to explore in the graphic novel. And uh, it's a cholera, cholera, uh, cholera. Anyway, due to that, uh, chapter five, uh, the, the chapter header for chapter five in my book, after um, all the other chapter headers have been about logging tools, the last chapter header is actually all about the kitchen tools, because um, it, is, it is absolutely necessary to the functioning of the logging camp. The dad in my book, Ahau, is inspired by Tai Sing, 
who was a cook with the United States Geological Survey. Um, he was a Chinese man, and he cooked for the Mather Mountain Party in 1915. If you're already familiar with forest history, you'll know that Mather Mountain Party was an exploratory expedition that very uh, that was kind of an early seed for the creation of the National Park Service. However, at this time, Tai Singh was already well known as a gourmet chef of the Sierra. Um, so it's six years before he even went on this expedition, a mountain in Yosemite, Sing Peak, was already named for him in 1899. Something else I learned, ox, as in Babe the Blue Ox, is not a species name, actually just a term for working bovine. Who knew? Well, maybe many of you knew, but I didn't. Uh, it's usually a castrated male cow in the United States, but there's not a separate species called an ox. So on the left is the Babe the Blue Ox statue in Klamath, California. Um, on my left is Pepe, my version of Babe, who's a water buffalo, which is a bovine often used as an ox in China and Southeast Asia. He basically behaves like a giant puppy, because as you might imagine, I have access to puppies um, and not to water buffalo. This is something you learn pretty early on while doing logging research, which is log drives, really cool, really dangerous. Uh, log drives are one of those things that have always survived the evolution of the Paul Bunyan mythos, which is why I really wanted to include one in my book. Actually, the largest historical stretch in my book is that log drives were pretty common in the Midwest, but they were actually pretty rare in the Sierra Nevada. Um, Sierra Nevada rivers just run faster. But I, I do include a little bit of that in my book by being like, well, it's really dangerous. <laughs> um, this is a goofy thing. Uh, there are Paul Bunyan statues across the United States. If we had more time, I'd tell you about fiberglass muffler men statues, which many of these are. But I made a bet with a friend to visit as many Paul Bunyan statues as I could in the United States eight years ago. I actually lost the bet. I visited about 20. He got about 30. But here are some of them. In the process, I developed a deep love for the, this part of the American mythos, because you can't spend so much time visiting Paul Bunyan statues without also getting into the history of Paul Bunyan, especially since a lot of these are also in front of logging museums. Um, here are a couple of muffler men, one in Northern Arizona University, upstate New York, an armless one on top of a Vietnamese restaurant in Albuquerque, Mexico. Here's a couple more. Uh, but basically, yeah, uh, the last one, the Paul Bunyan statue at the Trees of Mystery in Klamath, California, which will actually talk to you. Uh, yeah, I love Paul Bunyan so much. I wrote a whole book about it. He's a Chinese matriarch named Auntie Po. So next, I'm just going to run you super quickly through some uh, sketches from my book. These are references that I use to keep things consistent when drawing the book. Here are head turnarounds. I refer to these all the time when drawing. I want to show you a pro my, what my process looks like. So I sketch digitally. So here's a better look at my pencils, which are very, very quick sketches. This is what it looks like when I ink over them. I don't have a real pencil phase. I go directly from rough sketch to ink. After that, uh, I will remove the sketch layer and I will actually print these, uh, this version out um, at very low opacity, uh, mostly transparent on actual watercolor paper. So now the lines are just guidelines. I then put large splotches of watercolor down. This is actual paper. It doesn't look great right now, but it will look much better once I scan it. And I layer everything back together. Now it's starting to look a lot more like a finished page. And what I've done here is layer the ink layer over my scan of the watercolor painting. Finally, I do minor color edits also in Photoshop. And this is how we use this piece of art in the book. It's a title page. Um, it was gonna be the cover as a little bit set when it wasn't, but we still found an amazing place to use it. Um, this is the same thing as that hybrid digital traditional process I showed you earlier. Um, I just put it all on one page so maybe it's a little bit clearer. Um, I currently use this process for most of my work. It allows me to work significantly faster. And most importantly, I can do edits without repainting the entire book than my previous book, which was done almost entirely in watercolor and ink. So this is the first page, page of The Legend of Auntie Poe. So now super quick, and then I'll be done with my talk and we can do questions. Um, here are some secrets about making The Legend of Auntie Poe. The title of the book right here is actually hand carved. Um, I did carve all the letters backwards and we had to flip them digitally and clean them up a lot later. But uh, these are actually wood um, lino linotype prints that I, that I made. Um, I don't know how to draw horses at all. Um, this is very difficult because I am a, I write historical fiction. Um, and uh, historical fiction is just one of those things that's got horses, especially in the era I like to work in. So I had to ask a friend for help. I would sort of sketch my dorky little horses and she would redline them. 
and I would ink them over her sketches so they would look like actual horses. Uh, my mother did the Chinese translations in my book. We would send, uh, I, would, I would send her sentences and she would write the translations down on an actual piece of paper and mail them back to me and I would scan them. So her, her writing, uh, her actual handwriting is actually the Chinese characters in my book. It was a really lovely thing to be able to work with her that way. Um, one more thing, every time I got tired of drawing, I added a cat or chicken to the book. So if you picked up a copy of my book and counted all the cats and chickens, those were times where I was just, uh, you know, really tired. <laughs> Writing a, ma making a 280 page graphic novel takes a lot of time. So, and uh, this is the desk that I did most of that work in. Uh, on. It's real messy, um, but I like it. It is a slightly cleaner desk now. I've, I've been trying to improve the state of my workspace over time. So yes, this is my presentation. Um, please, please throw questions in the chat. Uh, ask me anything you like. I love talking about Paul Bunyan. I love talking about these things. So, so yeah, back to you, back to you, Jamie. <laughs> well, that was great. Um, and um, actually, folks, if you could put the questions in the Q&A, uh, oh, right. that, that makes it a little easier for us. Um, <clears throat> but what, um, so I'm, I see the parallels while we're waiting for folks to switch from chat to Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, at the end there where you were walking us through your process. Mm -hmm. and, and it struck me as very similar to uh, the the handful of filmmakers, the directors who storyboard out their, their films. Mm -hmm. And so is, was that, is that something, a process that you were already familiar with? How, uh, what am I trying to ask? I think I'm trying to ask if you storyboard out, how you have this idea, I'm gonna mm -hmm. take the Paul Bunyan myth, I'm gonna uh, put my spin on it. Mm -hmm. Walk me through um, that process from the, the artist's standpoint, or I guess both. It's the artist and the writer, because yeah. that's, uh, that's yeah, just it, fascinating it, it, to me. Right. Uh, in this case, I'm both the artist and the writer. Right. Um, and and the way, yeah, the way I think is essentially in storyboards. Um, so I actually write my script and I do my thumbnails very similarly, because deciding deciding how the story is told visually. Um, is is part of the process for me. Um, I I mean I don't currently write prose. I'm I'm starting to write more prose, but I am a cartoonist at heart. So this this is the medium that I work in. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that that text and images are actually happening at the same time. Even if I'm even if I write a script first, uh, the script. Uh, has a lot of notes in it to sort of tell myself what I'm thinking in terms of how the panels break down, in terms of how the uh, the characters are going to be interacting with each other. Uh, and yeah, it is it is very similar to a storyboarding process for a filmmaker, except I have a little more control over our page layouts. Yeah, but um, wow, yeah, that's I, I love learning about the process. Um, Emily pointed out that um, she says, it seems like there's a nice parallel between how we shape myths and how myths shape us and how we can shape forests as forests shape us. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think like, you know, you, you are definitely much more steeped in like the environmental science of forest and, you know, the history of forest it themselves. Mm -hmm. Although I did, I did read that that uh, that handout, that book that you gave me. Y'all, y'all should get a copy. It's great. Um, the one called Forest. In case, in case you're wondering, um, and and yeah, it's actually funny because sometimes this book gets included on sort of like uh, environmental, like books to read about the environment. Um, and and in this book, largely trees are getting cut down. Um, and I don't, and while I would have liked to have made uh, a statement that, you know, let's not do that so much, uh, the forest in this book is getting clear cut. They, they leave the forest because of clear, they've, they've clear cut it, they're moving on. Um, and, and it's actually really interesting because, um, 
in this case, what's being shaped by what the characters have done to the forest is that they have to move on. Um, Auntie Poe has to move on. Everyone has to move on because uh, this world that they've built for themselves no longer exists. Uh, and, and for our main characters, for, you know, Aha and May, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, you know, they, they do want to go to the city. They do want to go to Chinatown where they can be surrounded by... Um, like May wants to be surrounded by other younger Chinese people. Um, she does need to grow past kind of this this world, this protective world that her father has built for her, um, which they're sort of finding out is not quite as protective as they all thought. Uh, but yeah, yeah, and, and and of course, you know, the the part about myths shaping us, it's yeah, that that's obviously a major theme. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, just reading yesterday. Um... It's, it has not gone to print yet. I'm doing a peer review of, a, of an article in which the uh, historian talks about how, uh, and I think the historian is Willow Brown. She's at, on faculty at Harvard. Mm. But she's writing about the, um, talking about the, in part, the, the, the myth of the lumberjack, the, mm -hmm. how they were... To, to be generous and kind, uh, a rough and tumble lot that um, the middle class of a, of a mill town would have been, were frightened of. And then about a generation later, after the, the logging is done and the, they've moved on, the lumberjacks, they start adopting not only Paul Bunyan, mm -hmm. hence our muffler man uh, popping up like so many trees in <laughs> the country, but... Um, like with uh, Lauhead, the 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 myth gets cleaned, the the stories get yeah. cleaned up, and they start these towns start adopting um, Paul Bunyan, and this is why, in part, they're trying to get tourist dollars in yeah. the nineteen thirties. <laughs> uh, let's build a statue. Let's throw a festival, the lumberjack festival. Um, but that the cleaning up of the myth, you know, I, I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit how what you were seeing that transition from oral history mm -hmm. um to uh was it esther uh esther shepherd um yeah yeah, yeah. There, one of actually... the very first to collect and yes. publish the stories um yeah. I, was I was actually uh super delighted her copy uh i'm sorry the copy of her book that you have in your collection is actually the book that she gave to lawhead i know you have it open to that mm -hmm. um it was hilarious because like when I was there, like Evan handed me like a, a stack of books and I opened up that one and it was like, oh, wait, no, this is a personal copy. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, uh, um, anyway, uh, yeah, yes, yes. Um, so about myths getting clean up. So stories in the oral tradition, and this actually uh, intersects with with the with one of the comments in the Q&A, which is the uh, Appalachian Jack Tales. Um, so in the oral tradition, when stories are told, they're being told like, you know, in, in bunks, they're being told around the campfire, and they're not full stories. They're not stories with like a plot. Um, most of the times these stories are like, hey, do you remember when, you know, I worked with Paul Bunyan down the Round River Drive, and then someone else chimes in, and it was like, oh, was it when the ground froze over, and, and it just kind of goes on and on, and, and it's riff. Like, oral histories, I, I mean, oral, oral, narratives mm -hmm. um at these times they were essentially bits it's you and your friends riffing together kind of building a story together and you're just trying to make each other laugh um so what happens when these stories get recorded is that they get embellished upon um and lawhead is definitely it's definitely a pioneering figure in that regard because he actually cleans these stories up like they have sort of beginnings and ends um there's a great book out of the northwoods Michael Edmonds, uh, also in your collection, that uh, it, 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 compa it sort of has a chart of all of these stories and mm -hmm. how they've evolved through these collections. Like this is the overlap between Shepherd stories and Lawhead stories, um, overlap between the stories collected by uh, Bernice Stewart and, you know, the stories that are published in these like random journals early, early in the process. Um, so these stories get cleaned up. And like, not to be overly crude here, but you know, if anyone has been around a bunch of construction workers, 
or anyone doing manual labor. Like Paul Bunyan is like a gigantic man. Um, like, what do you think some of these jokes were about? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyone working with people who do manual labor, like, no, we all know where these jokes are going. Like, Paul Bunyan, you know, in many of these stories, like, had a wife. Like, what do you, <laughs> come on. Um, but these stories were not going to be passed down, like, told to a 22-year-old, like, recent college graduate. Um, you know, even if Bernice Stewart had grown up in logging camps, you're not you're not gonna tell a a story about Paul Bunyan's genitals, um, and so and so that that's you know part of part of the process of of these stories becoming more palatable um, for general audience. And actually, uh, it's interesting to think about the environmental aspect of it because the idea of Paul Bunyan as the first environmentalist does not happen until much later. Yeah. Um, the early stories, it's like, oh, what's Paul Bunyan good at? He's good at cutting down trees. Um, and then later there become stories like, oh, he actually like recycles these trees. Like he puts the trees to a lumber mill and then like the, the seeds come out and they become smaller trees that get replanted. Um, but but the idea of Paul Bunyan's environmentalist is not, it, it's not in the early stories. Um, and then past that, things get cleaned up even further. Like during the World Wars, he becomes adopted as a patriotic figure. Um, and some of this is very much due to Lawhead's work. Um, prior to his work, um, people don't know Paul Bunyan. Even the logging community is not entirely clear on who Paul Bunyan is. Uh, it, it's, it's part, uh, again, y'all have this delightful oral history. It's been transcripted, uh, so you can actually, I think it's downloadable from your website. But there's an oral history with, with Lawhead done, you know, when he's, I think, 80 or so. It's definitely in his later years. I think it's done, like, two years before his death. And he's talking about how his stories landed at first. Um, and because basically these stories went out as introducing Mr. Paul Bunyan of Westwood, California. Um, and the feedback from the logging community at this time was basically, who's Paul Bunyan? We thought the walkers owned the mill. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in about five years, uh, you know, he keeps on sending out these these stories and he's essentially doing it as a small press like he's he's sending out zines um and about five years the demand for these grow uh more people want these stories they do reprints and the myth of paul bunyan you know makes it out like all over america <clears throat> like school you know school children start telling these stories um and you know when school children start telling these stories they become children's stories and when they become patriotic stories, they become cleaner. Uh, yeah, and, and that then, switch over from who's Paul Bunyan? Yeah, um, you know that question being posed by uh, people in the industry to oh Esther Shepard compiling and selling, you know, publishing these. Um, it's pretty quick, but it's also I think the booklet he was sending out. It was complimentary. You could yes. get it for free. Yep. I think it's, uh, I want to say journalists got a hold of one. Mm -hmm. And it's basically once it gets out of that little silo and into the, out to the general public. Yeah. That's it was when it really starts taking off and does so to the point where in the 19, early 1940s, somebody takes that myth and actually writes an operetta. Yes. Uh, and that's which I was surprised to learn. Uh huh. Um, it's Benjamin Britten and W. H. Auden, um, who, if you're familiar with who they are, they are gay British men. Um, <laughs> so this is definitely, and, and it's it's a it's fascinating operetta. Um, although neither one of them are very proud about it. Like it was Benjamin Britten's first opera. He it actually he doesn't like talk about it in his later life. Yeah. Um, and it's a really interesting look into kind of how these two gay British men, um see American masculinity and kind of, you know, it's very much industrial revolution niche. Um, at the end of that operetta, Paul Bunyan goes away. And, and I believe um, Johnny Inkslinger, who is the accountant, uh, goes to work for Hollywood. Um, he, he goes to work as like as an accountant for Hollywood. And uh, Sourdough Sam, his cook, 
goes to work for a hotel. Like I think he goes to work for like the Ritz Carlton. So <laughs> the operetta is is very much about the loss of logging as a way of life hmm. and a loss of kind of that identification with um, the kind of masculinity that that's very associated um, with with American lumberjacks. I was interested to see that it was so this came out in early during World War II. Right? Yeah. So, but then that they attempted to restage it in around 2009 or so. Yeah, it's been restaged somewhat recently. Yeah. Um, and it's re, re and it's re um, restaged, you know, with some frequency. Uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, I don't think it's that good. Um, so maybe that's why. And, and it's also hyper specific. Uh, yeah. My favorite recording, I believe, is done by um, it's done by a Minnesota opera opera house. Okay, and and it's really lovely to sort of. Uh, there's also a version done by I think the London Opera, but that one feels really weird because it's a bunch of uh, it's a bunch of British people singing a British operetta about Americans. Yeah, about something that the British really have no. <laughs> direct connection to. So Helen uh, asks, what do you think about the role of magical elements in these tall tales, mm -hmm. um, such as Paul Bunyan or Auntie Poe and, <clears throat> and the variations on, on Babe being giants? And what does that mean to people who tell and hear the stories? Um, I think there's always uh, an understanding that, you know, these stories are magical. Like even in the tall tale um, variants. It's like, no, there isn't like a 30 foot tall person. Um, and, and I think it, it, it's part of how we use ritual and tall tales and tradition um, in order to organize our lives, in order to tell stories about our lives. And mm -hmm. it, it makes it safer when we can wrap them in these wrappers of magic and wrappers of myth. Yeah, you can see that playing out via Hollywood with all the Marvel yes. and Star Wars mm -hmm. films that they're they're churning out. Yeah, it's like um, we can tell, you know, we can tell stories about trauma. We can tell stories about the deaths in logging camps. Like we can tell stories about bad bosses who don't pay us, you know, when when they're all wrapped up um, in, in a myth. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do want to point out that in some tellings of Paul Bunyan, or maybe it's the, who's, yeah, some tellings, he's not a giant, a 30 or 40 foot giant, but he's um, like eight feet tall. He's just an extraordinarily large human. And those yeah. stories, do you, are you familiar with that variation? Yeah, and, it does. How that seems, plays out? It seems to grow over time. Uh, I think a lot of the eight foot Paul Bunyan stories uh, are very Franco Canadian. Um, mm -hmm. And, and there's actually a book, I don't know if it's gotten, it's, that kind of points to a person as being inspiration for Paul Bunyan, but largely a lot of academics don't take it very seriously yeah. um, because the myth obviously evolved so quickly. Um, and like, yes, of course there were big people in logging camps. <laughs> um, so... Jay Ackley says, uh, you Yay! talk about... <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I know Jay. Yeah, clearly, um, which is great. He's from Minnesota. <laughs> okay. Uh, he says, you talk about cooking as a major element of the logging camp experience. And there's um, a historian down at University of North Carolina, Charlotte. He's doing a postdoc there, Jason, oh man, Wilson or Williams. But he's doing work on... Uh, sorry, sorry, Jay, I'm, I'm digressing, and, and but rooting this in academics, right? So, um, but Jason's doing this work where he talks about the the body and the energy required uh, just to carry out the work in the woods and the the, the amount, the calories, and, and just how um, in the industry and the camp owners kind of started looking at lumberjacks as machinery. The body as a machine, it needs X number of calories to function and not break down. Anyway, digression ends. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, uh, but I, I, I could sort of talk about both, actually. Okay, so um, Jay's question is, how, how yeah, has your research into food and cuisine in the camps 
ever had any impact on your own cooking or food experiments? Have you suddenly taken up a, a taste for flapjacks and? <laughs> uh, no. Um, <laughs> That's my question. I mean, I mean sort of, yeah, sort of yes, in a sense. Um, like I've definitely, uh, it, I've gotten more into the research of kind of Chinese cooking methods around that time. Um, and I, and I have become more interested in them. Uh, like, you know, chop suey, like that's kind of an interesting thing that comes out of San Francisco of Chinatowns around that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there is sort of a, it's not really proven, we're not really certain it's true, but it came out of railroad camps, where essentially food was thrown together in a block. Uh, so I, I yes, yeah, some of those things have inspired my own cooking. But to be perfectly frank, a lot of cooking at logging camps uh, was not known. Yes, it was known for being good. Uh, for lumberjacks of the 1800s. <laughs> I, I have, I, I actually did throw a lumberjack party um, with some friends and we did flapjacks and bacon um, using like old, old world grains to kind mm. of see how it, how it would go. And, you know, it was good. But the thing about lumberjacks is that they worked like dawn to dusk. Um, they would log, you know, a, 80 trees a day. Um, and I am not a person who does that labor. I am a soft, squishy writer. So I can subsist on a packet of ramen and maybe some canned fish. <laughs> um, yeah, like, I mean, I, I love researching the cooking, but it's, it's not, yeah. <laughs> it's not food that I would personally eat. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, but it, this whole, uh, re-examination of the the lumberjack the the human body as engine mm -hmm. and the fuel that goes into it is um is something that historians really haven't gotten into until jason started digging into this so yeah i'm, I'm excited love, to see what he's going to be producing to read more of that yeah and, uh, and so many of the paul bunyan stories do center around food um actually one of those uh, when i mentioned earlier that some of the stories uh, were racist, but nevertheless, like, acknowledged the presence of, mm. of marginalized workers. One of the common stories is of uh, the, is Paul Bunyan's pancake. Uh, his, gr his griddle. Yeah, the, I'm sorry. Yeah, the griddle is the word I was looking for. Yeah. The griddle. And oftentimes the workers who would grease the griddle would be young Japanese boys or young black boys who would strap butter to their feet and go skating around the griddle in order to grease it. Um, and one of the things Paul Bunyan was really good at is his kitchen, uh, led by Sourdough Sam, who I adapted in my book as I'll say I'm a Chinese cook, could mm. produce like so much food, um, just absurd quantities of food. Yeah, and that, that um, myth gets picked up by companies other than Red River. So yes. Winterhauser Company uh, in the 1930s had a, a lumberman who was uh, slightly bigger than your average human. Um, oh gosh, what was, and I think his first name was Paul too. I'm just blanking on his I mean, name. you know, Paul Bunyan as a, as a character was, I mean, this is in your, in your, um, in your display. Um, but yeah, Paul Bunyan wasn't copyrighted. Right. Um, that's, that's the fascinating thing yeah. is how anyone picks it up. Oh, the lumber, the, Lumberjack working for Warehouser was named Paul Searles, and he was he had it was the, he was the Paul Bunyan of fill in the blank. Yeah. But they and took promo photos of him with a stack of pancakes, like you know, like this, yes. like 30 <laughs> pancakes and um, all, all sorts of things like that, where they keep playing that up. Um, and uh, and Lawhead actually specifically um, did not copyright his stories. Oh, why um, is that? Uh, because they wanted them to be spread far and wide. They wanted them to be riffed on. Because it's free publicity for the company. Yeah, it, it, yeah he was a marketing guy. He was yeah, not an author. Um, so they did what was most beneficial for the Red River Lumber Company, not most beneficial for Lawhead's reputation as a writer. Which, he, as you mentioned earlier, he struggled with both. Yeah. He, he's... Well, actually, I do want to mention his paintings... We've got uh, uh, <clears throat> evidence, or we found um, that his paintings were exhibited. Oh, yes, in two places, actually. But okay. um, they were largely, like, storefronts. Yeah. You know, like, uh, yeah, they, they never had, like, a gallery exhibition. Okay. Um, 
yeah i i, I wrote sort of a, a summary of of all that i okay I, well, have... I do know that where he where lao had retired to susanville california yes, there was a yes. hotel there that they exhibited those and i think he so there there was yeah, that he never, he never strayed too far from westwood no uh, Jessica says, what was Paul's reputation during the Depression and in conjunction with or in contrast to the Civilian Conservation Corps? Was he ever utilized for those work camps? Hmm. I don't know. Um, so I do know that um, the U.S. Forest Service picked up the Paul Bunyan myth and, and began using him as a, a safety spokesman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, so there's, we've got some stuff from uh, the Rudy Wendelin, who was the artist most closely associated with Smokey Bear for about mm -hmm. 40 years. Uh, Rudy used Paul um, as a safety spokesman. And then, and I do want you to talk a little bit about um, how they start playing with the myth and these stories. Um, Rudy is one of several artists who uses uh, the Paul Bunyan's daughter, Paula. Yes. As uh, now in Rudy's case for the Forest Service, she's a safety spokeswoman or spokesperson. That's delightful. <laughs> um, and that's in our exhibit. But then um, I know Lau had during World War II uses the daughters of Paul Bunyan yes. aspect to talk about how the women have replaced the men in the, the sawmills. Yeah, there's actually a lot, uh, a lot of ads for the Red River Lumber Company around World War II because you know they really wanted to, like, basically it was there were a lot of like we are supporting the war effort. So, um, so Paul, but you know Paul Bunyan as well, and I don't think he he never drew like daughters of Paul Bunyan. The images that accompanied these ads were of the actual women yeah. working at the Red River Lumber Company. Um, but you know I, I feel like all lumber companies were kind of doing that at the time. Like there was a lot of patriotism. There was a lot of, yes, we are supporting the war effort. So of course, Paul Bunyan and, you know, would have been wrapped up. Yeah, in all that. Uh, you're absolutely right. What, what I've seen in the Lauhead papers is the use of photos of women at work. Yes. And they, they make it clear that this is, that women came out, of, they, they change, they're breaking down gender barriers mm -hmm. in the workplace. Um, it's almost this undercurrent of, we didn't know women could do this work. Oh, and absolutely. Now, and now they're stepping up to do it. The implication, of course, being that when the, when the war's over, these women will no longer be doing this work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but, you know, that, <laughs> that was the overwhelming sentiment at the time. <laughs> yeah. It was all of its time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So Mary Elizabeth uh, Brown, who I know is in, lives in Oregon, uh, asks, have you come across any overlap of Sasquatch with Paul Bunyan? So here's another mythical figure. Yeah. Uh, Sasquatch, I'm not sure about Sasquatch specifically. Um, there's another myth. Um, and this comes out of, uh, it, it's part of the oral interview with Lawhead as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I God, what is the... What is that cryptid? It's kind of like a short, stocky thing. Uh, maybe it starts with a G. Um, okay, the, the the name of this creature completely escapes my head. Uh, but there was a, a lumberjack, uh, or at least someone associated there, mm -hmm. who told a lot of tall tales. That was kind of his whole deal. And he yeah. told them about this weird... Oh, the hodag! Sorry, the hodag. Um... So he told stories about the Hodag, uh, and he also, as far as we know, told stories about Paul Bunyan. So um, there was definitely overlap in terms of kind of Northwood's mythical cryptid um, and Paul Bunyan stories, because they, they exist, existed in kind of the same conversations. They existed in the same, it is the same form of storytelling. Um, Sasquatch, uh, probably. I think Sasquatch is more kind of northern. Uh, it's very like northern United States, I believe, in terms of a cryptid source. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I feel like, yeah, th there probably would have been overlap in like kind of the more Franco-Canadian regions. Um, yeah, not off the top of my head, because honestly, I don't think this is a 
specific question I've thought about before, right. but I am now very interested to look for more. Well, it's, uh, but it speaks to the interest in, in myths and legends. Um, yes. What I find fascinating is uh, I'm seeing signage and bumper stickers and the like, or little stickers on cars uh, with the, just the silhouette of Sasquatch. There's no text with it or whatsoever. It's just, you have to know what it is, but then the, you know, is the person saying, I believe, or is it, are they doing this with a wink and a nod of, you know, be, beware or whatever it is. I just find you can see that myth spreading again, uh, or, or, or just mm -hmm. spreading period. Um, but it, it's, yeah, it's uh, all of that is. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, myths and stories shift over time. And, uh, and one of my fascinations about Paul Bunyan is that it is, it's just a really distinctly American mythological figure. Um, like in terms of, you know, mythological figures as in like the Greek gods, yeah. uh, you know, Paul Bunyan is very singular in, in that way for America. Um, and, and it makes a lot of sense that yes, but because of America as being such a new country, um, comparatively to like, you know, ancient mm -hmm. Greece, um, the myth of Paul Bunyan takes on the characteristics of the people that, that tell them, <laughs> um, and it continues to shift over time. Yeah. Like, and, and that, that is delightful and it's very special and meaningful to me. And the rise of the Paul Bunyan myth also follows after the, um, it's happening in, in literary and, and painting circles, the striving for um, specific American art. Yeah. You know, the um, Hudson River School of Landscape Painting, for example, where it's, we need to break from Europe. We need to have our own uh, style of painting, our own style, our own literature. And in, in this case also then, it's also, we have to have our own myths. You know, the, yeah. um, the Grimm brothers' tales certainly come with the immigrants and are told and retold and same same thing with Paul Bunyan where these are really dark stories yeah. that if you go back to the sort original ones holy cow these are at best PG-13 um <laughs> some of the um violence and, and the like um that's in, in those and Paul Bunyan goes through that similar process but anyway I, I'm just trying to put I guess I'm putting Paul Bunyan in that it's, if you will, it's part of the American exceptionalism in that yeah. way in, in the art world. Mm -hmm. um, Jessica um, says, I remember Paul Bunyan and John Henry crossovers and competitions once being a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I have a vague recollection of that myself. I could not tell you what the, how the, uh... those competitions played out, but do, do you remember? There's actually, there's a bunch of editorial cartoons um, around kind of the world wars around the time of we're all talking about like American exceptionalism. Um, there, there's a bunch of editorial cartoons where Paul Bunyan and John Henry actually frequently appeared together. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, because they are both, you know, they're both um, kind of American myths. Uh, John Henry, to me, feels much more rooted in a real person um because you know many black men died like <laughs> building railroads that's what happened um so so yeah but but they they do appear kind of concurrently um especially sort of in the 1940s um uh, i i want to there's an somebody who's anonymous um First of all, it says, absolutely love this presentation um, and asks a question to, to me in FHS. How delightful has it been having more storytellers using and referencing our archives? Um, and I mean, I hope that, it's been delightful. I intend to come back. <laughs> <laughs> they said they've been dabbling in, a bit in environmental storytelling and, and want to come visit. Well, yes, we, I mean, we, so I'm going to state the obvious, which is all are welcome to come and do research. Mm -hmm. But to have somebody like Shing come in 
with a very different background and 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 perspective on the the primary materials. It's um, it's energizing is how I would best describe it because um, especially when you're just mucking around in the the scholarly world, it uh, can get very staid. But to have um, and this is why we we thoroughly enjoyed having having you here, Shing, and we're eager to have you come back. <laughs> was um, the the set of the questions and the 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 way like it's uh, I'm not doing it justice, but the um, it's just a different set of questions. And it real what I love as a historian is it gets me thinking very differently about the material, what's in the material, and then how anyone telling the bigger history story um, that there, there's just so many different ways of doing it. Um, it's, it helps me as well um, and to think more creatively. Uh, one, one of the things I've dabbled in a little bit is the, with doing research on the Hudson River School painters because they're in a way documenting the changes in the American landscape. Um, but then we see that those influences play out uh, directly on foresters, uh, specifically coming wow. to mind Gifford Pinchot, who's uh, named for the artist Sanford Gifford, who was his godfather. And um, the, you know, those paintings hung in the, in the Pinchot home, um, showing clear cuts and, and the impact. So there are definitely those connections there. Um, Jessica, and, and I really appreciate Jessica uh, throwing these out there. Yes, there was a Disney movie about uh, yes, Paul it Bunyan. Yes, was a series. And, and there's also, we've got a compilation of, um, it's a, a video of different cartoons yeah. thrown mm -hmm. together and it's, uh, or brought together. And on got the John Henry, uh, Johnny Appleseed, Paul Bunyan, um, yeah. maybe Davy Crockett, you know, who was yeah. real, obviously. Um, but yeah, yeah, those things. Uh, oh, I wanted to add that, um, you know, as, as a, as a, someone who's largely a storyteller, and like, I do do pretty rigorous research, but being able to go to the Forest History Society and sort of understand better the context in which I was telling these stories. Cause I, I've been really laser focused on like the myth of Paul Bunyan and to a larger extent, like logging camps. Um, but I actually was not, uh, I did not know a lot about really the history of force, <laughs> um, which sounds silly, but you know, you can, you can miss these things when, when you're laser focused on a particular topic. And it was, yeah, it, it was a very, it was an incredible educational experience. And I, and I deeply appreciate all the time that y'all, y'all put in to helping me out. Um, also the ribs that Steve bought. <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's true. If you come research, you get, uh, you get your choice of uh, barbecue styles. Eastern yeah. Eastern, Western, North yeah. Carolina. Uh, fantastic hush puppies. Like never had them before. Uh, you know, oh, wow. changed my life. <laughs> that, that that's how that's how uh this research has affected um my my food <laughs> preferences uh turns out i'm really into like corn-based dough now <laughs> uh, muriel moore asks if you plan if you have any more books planned using the characters in auntie po um no um and the reason for that is because uh historically speaking May's gonna end up going through like it's still not gonna be easy for her like it's actually really hard to write um the history of Chinese Americans at this time especially at you know a middle grade level this is a book for eight to twelve year olds yeah um and at some point it does become difficult to sort of acknowledge what life would be for you know a 13 year old girl in San Francisco Chinatown at some point it's like how do you write a book that doesn't you know talk about opium dens or prostitutes, mm. or like gangs. Um, it's really hard. Or, or just you know, make it. There's just so much violence. Um, there's a lot of racial tension. Uh, San Francisco literally gets burnt down. You know, so yeah. <laughs> so it becomes a very challenging children's book to write. Fair enough. Uh, 
Well, Ching Yin Kor, thank you so much. The book is The Legend of Auntie Poe. 